be someone who cultivates a love for God's Word. It's not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Do you have a smile on your face this morning? Well, welcome. Good to be together. And uh, by the way, how many of you have been having some electrical outages where you live? Raise a hand if that's you. Okay. We are sorry for what you are suffering through. Uh, but they say it's only about another 15 days. So, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But yeah, we've got major outages in parts of the city. And uh, it's a little tough when you don't have electricity. But praise God that we have electricity, we have coffee, we have running water here. So uh, it's nice to come to church and make sure you have all those things. So good morning, everybody. Welcome in Jesus' name. And welcome to those who are joining us on Faith TV, as well as on Impact Radio and all our online platforms. We are glad to have you. We'd also like to say welcome to first-time visitors that are with us today. And we'd encourage you to please stop by our little welcome booth in the foyer because we have a welcome envelope that we'd like to give to you and we also have a little gift so it's worthwhile stopping by there now last weekend we had a uh, we had a really good youth camp that took place a uh, wonderful youth camp that took place uh, some people are really getting excited about that applause little moment there. So there was lots of activities, lots of fun, as obviously you also got to have all of that stuff on a camp. There were about 140 people in total on the camp. And most importantly, God touched young people's lives. So we're about to play you just a little minute and a half video, a little recap video. But I want to mention that right at the start of the video, there's a young guy who shares just briefly at the start. And uh, this young guy, he comes from a Muslim family and he was on the camp. Let's roll this video. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Adnan, I don't know if you guys can hear me, my voice is a bit, you know, but anyways, um, people call me Adidas, today I want to share, <laughs> okay, so today I want to share something similar to, I don't know if it connects to Hanasa, I don't know where she is right now, she said she had a vision for me, right, I actually want to announce that I actually became Christian today, and, um, um, it wasn't easy, obviously, but I just want to, also say thank you to everything and everyone that's here and for everyone that put in the hard work and the leaders themselves and the band is just it's fabulous and amazing and phenomenal. Going three weeks ago, um uh, my knee got hurt at hockey and we didn't know what was wrong. And for the past week I've been on crutches and we thought the bone was broken. And now we were all just praying for my knee and we felt the bones kick back together and my knees are yoke. <laughs> Let's thank the Lord. Can we do that? Praise God for what took place. And uh, well done to Michael and the team of leaders. There's a great team of leaders. And so don't forget, Pulse Youth happens every Friday night. And you are invited to that. Well, that's if you're in high school. Uh, and also don't forget, the choice, Young Adults, happens every Sunday night. If you're 18 to 28 years of age, God is doing good things in our younger generations. This is the younger ministries. This is the year of Timothy raising up the next generation. Uh, one practical announcement is that we will have a new members 
evening, a new members meeting this coming Wednesday evening, quarter past seven for half past seven, and we invite you to come along. If you have been visiting our church and you feel like, hey, uh, I feel like this is where I want to be, I'd love to meet with you this Wednesday night, myself and the other pastors, and we encourage you, get connected into the local church. Don't just visit, but also say, this is going to be my home. I'm going to become a member here. It's a once of two hour meeting, which you would probably find inspiring as well. So please let InfoDesk know if you'd like to be a part of that. And then we're going to continue this morning with our First Timothy series. This is the third last part of First Timothy. We're making good progress and we look forward to that today. So may I invite you to stand and let's just greet some people around about you. Give some smiles to somebody. Give a couple of handshakes. Make somebody feel right at home today. Good. Let's remain standing. We're going to pray. We're going to dedicate this time to God. I just want to point out to you that we are blessed to be gathered together like this. Oh, how good and how pleasant it is when brethren and sisters dwell together in unity. And so let's dedicate this time to God. Father, thank you for this day. It's a beautiful day. Thank you for the warmer weather we're experiencing at the moment. And we rejoice in you. And we dedicate this time into your hands. Oh God, would you come and we ask that your presence would be evident, that your power would be evident in this place, and that the love of God would be evident. So thank you, Father. Now we're going to begin to honor you, celebrate you. Let your praise be glorious in this place. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you, Liesl and team. Good morning, everybody. Are you ready to praise God? Hallelujah. Let's make some noise.
continually be in my mouth. And Lord, we declare that you are exalted, that you are praised. There is simply no one like our God. There is no one like Jehovah. In Jesus' name, amen. You may take your seats. We're going to have an opportunity to bring our offerings to the Lord right now. And so if you'd like to give, this is an opportunity if you'd like to scan the QR code in, on the seat back or on the announcement flyer, give that away or give as you leave. It's important that we honor the Lord with our giving and let's just have a moment of prayer and then that will take place. Father, we come before you to give to you in this way. We declare, Lord, that we love you and we really want to be people who give to you not with a heavy heart, but give to you out of a joyful heart. And Lord, we say thank you that you are our Father and you take care of us. Thank you for your blessing on this offering now. In Jesus' name, amen. The details are now on the screen. to me this is God's word God said it I believe it and that settles it remember to always cultivate a love for God's word God's word for us as believers is the full and final authority and so we need to honor God's word accordingly let's just pray father we dedicate this time around your word into your hands 
We ask you, Father, that you would open our hearts and our understanding to be able to get it, to get what you're saying, understand it with clarity, and let it be such that it affects our thinking and the way in which we operate. Thank you that your word renews our mind. And so we thank you for renewed minds. I thank you for so, uh, soil that is receptive to the seed of the word today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of what I'm sharing with you today, this is the book of 1 Timothy, part 9, that we are dealing with. So for those that have just connected in on television, online, that we are currently preaching through the book of 1 Timothy. And uh, camera 2, you need to lower your camera, please. Just take note. Sorry, a little technical thing. I can't help that I'm a little bit technically minded. So... First Timothy is a fascinating book, and it covers very interesting topics. It covers a variety of issues. And so Paul is helping young Timothy. Remember, Paul is not present. Paul is elsewhere, and he is writing to Timothy, who is in Ephesus, and he is helping the Ephesian church to head in the right direction. He's helping the Ephesian church to get towards greater health and greater well-being. And it's so wonderful that young Timothy had Paul to help him and guide him and lead him. Uh, It's very important that we have fathers in the faith helping the younger generation, spiritual moms and dads. Now, today's passage, listen to this, deals largely with how to treat elders in the church. Now, you might say, well, I don't know, how relevant is this to me today? Maybe you're not involved in church leadership and you're thinking elders and how to treat elders and all of that. But let me say this. God has chosen his church as his vessel, an agent of change in the world today. Do you agree with that? The Bible says that God has chosen to reveal his manifold wisdom through the church. And so I believe that as believers, we need to have an understanding how all these different aspects of the church are meant to work. We need to understand it. If this is God's vessel, if this is what God is going to use, we need to know how this thing needs to function. And also, um, you might be listening to me and you're in an environment where there's unhealthy aspects in terms of the leadership and so on. And, and God might be talking to you in terms of this, but let God's word speak and let, us, let it change us. Remember, as a church, we are committed to not only speaking on the nice stuff. <laughs> Anybody with me? Okay, about three of you. Anybody with me? Okay. We're not just going to talk about the, I have good plans for you, which is awesome. We talk about that as well. But we talk about details of how the church should function. So we are looking at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 to 25. Today I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. It particularly provides clarity in this translation on what is said here. So it starts off by saying, elders... Now, elders are the leaders in the church, the more senior leadership team in the church. I'm reading from verse 17. It says, elders who do their work well should be respected and paid well, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, You must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating while it treads out the grain. And in another place, those who work deserve their pay. Do not listen to an accusation against an elder unless it is confirmed by two or three witnesses. And I would suggest that in this context, it's like frivolous accusations and just, oh, this this person is a personality clash clash and frivolous things and And only when there are serious things and it is confirmed, we should look at those things seriously. And verse 20, it says, those who sin should be reprimanded in front of the whole church. This will serve as a strong warning to others. 
I solemnly command you, Timothy, in the presence of God and Christ Jesus and the highest angels to obey these instructions without taking sides or showing favoritism to anyone. Never be in a hurry about appointing a church leader. Do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Now this interesting verse here, don't drink only water. You ought to drink a little wine for the sake of your stomach because you are sick so often. <laughs> Some people are saying, I, I like that scripture verse. <laughs> what, what's Pastor John going to say about that one? So... Obviously, Timothy had some struggles with his health, with his stomach. And so Paul was saying, listen, it might help if you take a little bit of wine. It might help you because you are often sick in terms of your stomach. By the way, I remember the pastor saying years ago, Tim Salmon. He said, so the scripture basically says, if your name is Timothy and you have stomach problems, then you should drink wine. You know, <laughs> anyhow. Verse 24, it goes on and it says, Remember, the sins of some people are obvious, leading them to certain judgment. But there are others whose sins will not be revealed until later. In the same way, the good deeds of some people are obvious. And the good deeds done in secret will someday come to light. Some people hide their good deeds. They don't want anybody to know, but... God says that uh, wonderfully those things will come to light. So please keep your Bible open and we thank God for his word. Amen? Amen. Good. So there are three points that I'd like to share with you today. Point number one, elders who lead well should be honored. If you look at the context of what is being said here, that is a nutshell little statement. Elders who lead well should be honored. Please say that with me. Elders who lead well should be honored. Now, still in the NLT, NLT, verse 17 to 18, just to recap, it says, Elders who do their work well should be respected and paid well, especially those who work hard at both preaching and teaching. For the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox as it treads from eating as it treads out the grain. And in another verse, those who work deserve their pay. Verse 17 in the New King James Version puts it in more familiar phrasing. It says, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Would you say double honor? Especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. And so here we find that Paul is mindful of what's going on in Ephesus. And Paul is mindful of the elders there and the dynamics that Timothy is dealing with. And Paul gives instruction to Timothy that elders who rule well are worthy of double honor. You see, I believe that Paul, he wanted to make sure that elders were taken care of. Because here's the thing, if the elders were flourishing then the church would be flourishing. Am I right? Everything rises and falls on leadership. If you have an eldership team that is in a mess, the chances of that church thriving are very, very few and slim. But if you have an eldership team that is healthy and honoring and following God, the chances are that church will thrive as well. Now, in terms of ruling well, that phrase ruling well, refers basically to elders who are setting the right example and leading in a commendable way. It's so much easier for the people in the congregation to follow the church leadership team if they are seeing an example in front of them in ways that the leaders are conducting themselves and they're leading in a commendable way. And such elders should receive, according to scripture, double honor. In this case, honor refers to two things. It refers, number one, to respect, and number two, to financial reimbursement. Now, in terms of respect, basically what's been said here that if an elder is faithful in the work of the Lord and serving well, then he deserves, the, he or she deserves the respect 
of the congregation, the respect of the people of God. And then in terms of the second aspect, financial reimbursement, if an elder is fully devoted to the word of God, and I mean they're basically spending all their time on the word of God, then according to this passage, they ought to receive financial compensation. Now verse 17, the second part, uh, says, especially those, referring to elders, who work hard at both preaching and teaching. So this principle that Paul's speaking about of honor is especially applicable to honors uh, to, to elders who are responsible for preaching and teaching the word of God. Now such elders would no doubt have other responsibilities in the church, different responsibilities, but their primary duty would be to teach and to preach. And given that they would be spending so much time focusing on this preaching and teaching, they could actually not carry out a regular job. And hence, they needed to be financially taken care of. And this is what Paul is bringing across. Paul then backs up this uh, instruction to honor the elders by quoting from two verses. He quotes from one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. And I'll just read them to you. You don't need to turn there. The Old Testament one is Deuteronomy 25 verse 4, where it says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Now, I'm sure every young person in this church understands exactly what that means. (laughs) Just kidding. You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Now, In the old days, it's very different to how it happens nowadays and there's machinery and all of this. In the old days, what would happen is you would have an ox and that ox would be tied to a pole and that ox would walk around and around and around on top of the grain. It wasn't a very exciting life for the ox. (laughs) Not much of a view, but here they are and going round and around in the same place. And they are treading out the grain. They are treading out the grain on the the threshing floor. And so the hooves of the ox would separate the kernels from the chaff so that they could get the kernels and then take it further in terms of production. And so God commanded that while this ox is working, while it is working and going around and around and walking on the grain, it should not be prevented from eating. Do not muzzle the ox. The muzzle is the thing that they put over the mouth so that the poor thing can't eat. It's like taking your kid to spur and then putting a muzzle on them and say, you know, or taking them to McDonald's, you can't have the Happy Meal, just look at it, just look at it. Okay, dad's gonna eat it right in front of you. We're gonna muzzle you, no. Um, Where did that come from? But anyhow, so you shall not muzzle the ox so that it can eat while it's treading out the grain. And I'm thinking firstly to myself, how considerate of our God. Isn't that lovely? How considerate that the Lord is even looking out to animals to make sure that you take care of your animals correctly. By the way, the Bible says a righteous man looks after his animals. Very interesting. And so basically this image of the ox and treading out the grain and so on, Paul used this image to demonstrate that elders should receive adequate financial support from the work that they are giving themselves to. And that's the Old Testament scripture. Paul also backs it up with a New Testament scripture. And it's Luke 10 verse 7 where Jesus said, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. You see, a laborer should be allowed to benefit from the production and the work that he's involved in from the fruit of his labor. He deserves to share in the benefit of what is happening. And it's the same way for elders. According to this passage of scripture, if they are serving well, then they should receive support from the congregation. And having said this, I'd like to say that we would like to appreciate our congregation at Choose Life in no uncertain terms. Because of your faithfulness to the Lord, the elders, the pastors here, 
are honored and they are taken care of. And we want to say to you that we appreciate you as the congregation and we honor the Lord for his goodness. Amen. Can we put our hands together? We thank the Lord for that. I remember when we were starting Choose Life and at that point in time, I was working at a computer company in uh, the Linwood area. So there I was involved there and I had thought that I would probably need to work for about two years still full time at that company before the church could be able to bring me on staff. And so I had prepared in my mind. I thought most likely I'd be working there for two years, then the church can build things up, and then I can come on staff. I thought if things went really well, maybe it would just be a year that I would be there. But I'd also factored in that maybe the church might grow very slowly, and perhaps for three or even four years, I would need to be working full time, and then basically pastoring on a Saturday and a Sunday. But you know the amazing thing? God exceeded our expectations, and one month later, I had to go (laughs) full-time. Praise God for that. It was so wonderful, so wonderful. People were starting to come to me. Can they see me? Can they meet with me? No, sorry, I'm not available. I work. I'm sorry, I can't meet with you. I can't counsel. I can't pray for you, etc. And uh, the team that was around me said, John, you need to go full-time now after a month and I was like God this is a dream come true and sometimes when I think back on that I still need to pinch myself was that real but it was God that God alone praise God amen so that's point number one elders who lead well should be honored number two elders are held to a high standard of righteousness Please say this with me. Elders are held to a high standard of righteousness. This is a biblical principle. You want to know what's in Timothy? You want to know more of the word of God? This is a principle in the word of God. There is a high standard. Now, verse 20 and 21, I'd like to read from the NIV because of the way it puts it there. Paul says the following to Timothy. He says, those elders who are sinning, You are to reprove before everyone or rebuke before everyone so that others may take warning. I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels, by the way, the elect angels are those that didn't uh, rebel against God. They held their former state and they remained faithful. So I charge you before in the sight of God, Christ Jesus, the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality, and do nothing out of favoritism. So it's interesting that the New King James Version says, those who are sinning. The NIV says, those elders who are sinning. And I believe that the latter represents this picture more fully. I want to say that I've carefully looked into this, and I'm confident That Paul was not referring to regular members at this point in time, but he was specifically referring to elders. So, in a nutshell, what was Paul saying? He was saying that elders who persist in sin should be rebuked before the whole church body. Now, I want to say that again. Listen carefully. He's saying that elders who persist in sin should be rebuked before the whole church body. I want to ask you, how would you like to be in that service? It's getting quiet in this church. It's like, no, no, that'll be hard. But you know what? Maybe it would be very good. Because perhaps it would instill something of the fear of God within the local church. And maybe the fear of God is more needed at this point in time. I'll never forget, years ago, I was a young boy in my dad's church, and I couldn't have been more than about eight years of age. And so in this situation, my dad was busy disciplining a church elder, and this was in the public church gathering. The elder was present because he was being disciplined because he had been involved in adultery. And I tell you what, it sure made an impact on me and on everybody present right there. 
Because suddenly you thought, wow, we need to be careful how we walk. We don't want to mess around with God. And so when I think of that and, and I think of what Paul is saying here today, I say the following, I want to ask the following, has the church gone too soft? Has the church maybe lost its saltiness? Has the church become maybe a little bit more like the world? And I say, for heaven's sake, no, please. Please, we can't, we can't go soft. And do you notice that Paul was so serious about elders being held to a high standard of righteousness that Paul said to Timothy, uh, verse 21 in the NLT, he said, I solemnly command you in the presence of God, Christ Jesus, and the highest angels to obey these instructions. Listen to those words, obey these instructions. Please say that with me, obey these instructions. What instructions? To publicly rebuke an elder who persists in sin. And so Paul is giving Timothy this command in the sight of three witnesses, in the sight of God, in the sight of Christ Jesus, and in the sight of the elect angels. That is quite something. That is quite something, you know. Now, let me just give you a crazy little example for a, for a moment. And, and if I pick on uh, Simon over here, Pastor Simon, and I say, uh, Simon, uh, you really need to wash your car. You know, you really need to wash your car. It's a little bit dirty. You're like, okay, whatever, I wash my car. If I say to Simon, listen, Simon, I solemnly command you <laughs> in the presence of God and Christ Jesus and the angels that you will wash your car. All of a sudden you're like, Whew, okay, what is this? I guess I'll wash my car just in case. You know what I mean? And so this is how Paul is speaking to Timothy about how important it is to follow through these instructions. In other words, Timothy, this is serious business. Timothy, you have to act. God is a holy God, church. God is a holy God, and he has called his church to holiness. We cannot turn a blind eye to sin amongst the eldership. It needs to be dealt with and even made known to the congregation. And this will serve as a strong deterrent to others. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 Listen to the statement. It says, if an elder who is involved in sin is not held to account, then the church members may begin to justify their own sins. Yeah, that, that one, that, that leader, check what he's doing, that one, you know? And then you start to justify. You know what, folks? The purity of the church is at stake. The reputation of the church is at stake. And in some circles, reputations have been severely damaged because the focus on holiness and purity has not been sufficiently there. We cannot compromise on sin. But having said that, but if an elder is repentant and remorseful and heartbroken, then that is altogether a different story. Then there can be loving discipline, there can be restoration, there can be healing because God is a God of restoration. And by the way, in terms of dealing with church discipline, there are two dangers that we need to avoid which also comes out in this chapter. And uh, the dangers that we need to avoid is prejudice and partiality. This is according to verse 21, the second part. Prejudice. So Paul's saying to Timothy, listen, as you handle issues like this, where you may need to correct an elder or deal with sin in the camp, he says, you cannot be prejudiced. In other words, we need to avoid judging a situation until all the facts are on the table. We can't make a call on things until we have the full picture. In other words, don't prejudge a matter. I heard a, a statement years ago. I think it's a really, really good one. It says, wisdom doesn't judge what it doesn't understand. And so you need to understand the situation before making a call on it. So Timothy, as you handle these things, no prejudice. Don't jump to conclusions. And then also, the other thing is partiality needs to be avoided. What is partiality? Well, this is the fact that we need to be sure 
that we don't favor someone and lean towards them if they've done something wrong in a leadership position. And then we want to go soft on them because, well, maybe they're our friend or, or, or they're in leadership position or maybe they're very wealthy. No, there can be no place for favoritism. Amen? And so, as I was preparing this sermon during the week, I was happily just typing along and preparing my sermon. And, and then this text was beginning to speak to me. It was beginning to speak to me. This aspect of elders who persist in sin should be rebuked in front of the whole body. Wow. And then I immediately thought of a situation that took place that emerged last year. And what happened last year is that we received a, a letter that was sent through to the church alleging that one of our pastors, one of our elders, had been involved in an extramarital affair, in adultery. Not fun when you receive a letter to that effect. What were we to do? Well, immediately we took the matter seriously because it seemed like this wasn't just some rash little thing being put out there. So we, we took it seriously. We then uh, called that pastor in and met with that pastor and uh, presented to him what had come in. He insisted that he was completely innocent and had done nothing wrong whatsoever. We said, well, these are serious allegations. And so therefore, we're going to have to look into this. So we then appointed an independent outside person to look into the matter. And uh, that person began to interview people and find out and gain evidence and so on. And eventually this person came back to us and said the allegations are true and correct. And the evidence is unmistakable, absolutely unmistakable. And yet there had been this indication from this man that he had done nothing wrong whatsoever. But the evidence was abundantly clear, abundantly clear. What were we to do? Well, we said, well, you are suspended. We actually suspended him immediately when we went into the investigation. We suspended this person. And then uh, we immediately then sought to go into a disciplinary process, into a disciplinary hearing. And then uh, we just really struggled because uh, we were trying to get him to come and be present at a hearing so that there could be a proper handling of this matter. And unfortunately, there wasn't cooperation, but weeks passed and weeks passed, and then there's this reason and that reason and this sick note and so on. So on. And eventually, a few months later, we received his letter of resignation and he resigned and left the employment of the church. In that time, we had been open with the pastoral team and also the shepherding team. And so about 40 or 50 of our leaders were aware of what was going down. But as I was reading this, speaking about elders who persist in sin, rebuked in front of the whole body, I realized God was talking to me. And so in that situation, I just felt, wow, I needed to say something this Sunday. And I want to say to you in line with that, if I erred in not bringing it to the corporate body, our corporate gathering, as your pastor, I ask for your forgiveness for that. And we will endeavor to make sure that we handle things even better in the future. And I trust that you extend forgiveness in that regard. Let me also just say this. I want to just also be clear that we did not fool around with sin. We dealt with the issue immediately so that it wouldn't affect the rest of the team. And so that is how it was handled. But I felt that it was important for me to speak here today and to mention that. Are you receptive to what I'm saying by a showing of hands? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, now, please tell the person next to you, you can breathe. Please tell them that. You can breathe. All right. 
But you know what? If it's in the Word, we've got to do it, folks. If it's in the Word, we've got to do it. If it's in the Word, you've got to do it. If it's the Word, I've got to do it. We are a Bible-based church. Now, point number three, which isn't a long point. Number three, carefully observe a person's true character before appointing them to leadership. Would you agree that that's something important? Carefully observe a person's true character before appointing them to leadership. And it says in verse 22 to 25 in the NLT, it says, Never be in a hurry about appointing a church leader. Do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Jump to verse 24. Remember, the sins of some people are obvious, leading them to certain judgments. But there are other sins, others whose sins will not be revealed until later. In the same way, the good deeds of some people are obvious, and the good deeds of some people done in secret will someday come to light. What is being said here? What's essentially the heart of this here is that choosing church leaders is a major responsibility. And please pray for us as your leadership team in, uh, when, when we need to appoint church leaders and so on. It is a real big deal and it requires careful consideration and also a great deal of prayer. And so here, Paul is instructing Timothy and us actually to never be in a hurry to appoint an elder because you could potentially overlook major issues. You could look, overlook major sins in that person's life. And by the way, earlier in 1 Timothy in chapter 3, the first 13 verses of Timothy 3 gives us an excellent list. Paul gives us this amazing list of characteristics that should be present in a person's life before they take on a leadership position in the church. And if we stick to that list, it will be a tremendous safeguard. And so Timothy needed to be sure about a person's character before inviting them on to the team. You know what, folks? It takes a bit of time to really discover a person's character. Isn't that true? It's not just like, you know, that's why I'm worried about speed dating. You know, speed dating. And you think you know a person's character. You know nothing. You've got you to look into things carefully. Because some people's good or bad points are obvious and you immediately see them, but other people's good or bad points are less obvious and it takes a period of time for them to come out. And that's why it's so important to carefully observe a person over time and only then to consider appointing them. And you know what? This is such wisdom from Scripture. Don't you love the wisdom that comes out of Scripture? And by the way, the same thing applies to seeking a marriage partner. The same thing applies to seeking a business partner. You need to give some time to observe their character before committing to them. I'm drawing to a close. Verse 22, I'd like to read it to you in the Passion Translation. So it says, don't be hasty. Timothy, I'm adding in Timothy, to ordain them with the laying on of hands. Now listen to this. Or you may end up sharing in their guilt should they fall. Keep yourself pure and holy and your standards high. So if you appoint a church leader without checking out their character and they fall morally, you can become associated with their reputation and with their sin. Do you know that the power of association is a very big issue? Listen to this quote, you are who you associate with. That's it, you are who you associate with. And so I want to say to you that church leadership needs to uphold a high moral standard. And so here we've been looking at this portion of 1 Timothy today, And I believe that we've been learning some things about how church should function, how it should be healthy. And we learned, number one, elders who lead well should be on it. Number two, elders are held to a high standard of righteousness. And number three, carefully observe a person's true character before appointing them to leadership. One thing is for sure, God is wanting his church to be in 
sound condition. God is wanting his church leaders, the elderships of churches right around the world. He wants them to be thriving and functioning well because then the church of Jesus Christ will be doing well and accomplishing the purpose for which God has brought it into being. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen. Come on, you can do better than that. We bless you, God. Your plan is the best. Your purpose is in Jesus' name. Can I invite you to stand as we pray? And then we're going to worship the Lord, continue worshiping the Lord. Father, we want to thank you today for your word. Father, we've touched on some things that haven't maybe been as easy as other places in 1 Timothy. But we thank you, Lord, that you saw it fit to include this. In the inspired word of God. This is scripture. And Lord we want to open our hearts to learn and to grow. In the many aspects where you teach us. Where you lead us. Where you guide us. Lord we give to you the eldership team in this church. And we pray that your hand would be upon this eldership team in a new way. We declare that our hearts are after you as an eldership. We declare that we humble our hearts before you. We declare that we purpose in our hearts to live righteously and in integrity. But it's only by the grace and the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I also believe that you could be convicting some people here today that they have fooled around in certain things and they have fooled around in terms of being involved in adultery. I thank you that the conviction of the Holy Spirit is working here today. I thank you, Lord, also for some people that have been living together and you're not married and you need to know that that is sin. Do not justify and call uh, what is evil good. And I want to speak out in the name of Jesus that the fear of God is coming upon this body in a new way by the work of the Spirit. Not an unwholesome fear, but a reverential fear of God that we realize, God, I don't want to mess around, that life is too short to mess around, but I want to honor you with my life. Take my life, Lord, and let it be consecrated, Lord, to you. I want my life to be consecrated. We want our lives to be consecrated. And so we cast off the weights and the sins that so easily entangle us and hold us back. We cast off those things. We repent of those things. And we declare that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I declare over every man and every woman here, young or old, under the sound of my voice today, I declare over everyone that is born again, you are righteous in Jesus' name. And I speak to you to live up to the righteousness that God has imputed into you. You are righteous righteous. You are righteous because what God has done. And God has given everything that you need to live a life of godliness. So we thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you've said, what you have spoken. And now, Lord, we just want to begin to redirect our focus now to adoration, to worship, as we continue worshiping in Jesus' name. Let's get ready to worship. We're doing a new song this morning. It's called Trust in God. And the chorus speaks about, I sought the Lord and He heard and He answered. And sometimes it's hard to fully trust God because what's in our minds and what we speak sometimes and what's in our hearts is not in alignment. So today when we say, I trust in God, fully trust in God, as we sing this new song, join with us. Thank you. Jesus. 
name that we give you glory, God. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom of the increase of your government and of peace there shall be no end. We worship you as the great I am. We worship you as the risen King. We worship you as the God who rides the heavens. We worship you as the great and victorious Lamb of God. So Lord, I believe that you have received our worship today. As we've honored you and lifted up your name. Oh Lord, what a joy it is to worship you. What a joy it is to worship you. What a joy it is to worship you. And so Father, we want a closing prayer. And just say thank you, Father. Thank you for what has happened in this place. Thank you for the work of your kingdom in this place. We dedicate our lives to you and we say, Lord, in this week ahead, we thank you that we walk with you. We have the companionship and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We pray for a blessed week, a prosperous week, full of your goodness. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand of thanks? You are free to be.